All right, so this is a video on the Basel problem, which was a very famous mathematical problem back in the 1600s, or at least it was posed back then. And it took almost a hundred years to solve it. And most of the biggest mathematicians of that day tried to solve it. So that's why it's incredibly interesting. And it's so easy to understand by just looking at it what the problem is, but it is enormously difficult to solve. So it's just 1 plus 1 over 2 squared plus 1 over 3 squared plus 1 over 4 squared and it keeps going like that. You can see you have all of the integers here in the denominator and they're all squared. So if you actually squared them out you get 1 fourth, 1 ninth, 1 sixteenth. Like I said it's pretty easy to understand the problem but solving it was immensely difficult. Okay, so the problem was first posed in 1644, and it was in 1665 that the mathematician John Wallace took a stab at it and computed it to about 1.645. Okay, so he had three decimal places of accuracy. So after John Wallace worked on the problem, there was a large gap where not much was really done on it. You can see here that he did it in 1665 and it wasn't until 1731 that Leonard Euler was able to compute it to six decimal places of accuracy and in the meantime most of the world's great mathematicians tried to solve it okay, inc including Gottfried Leibniz who helped invent calculus next to Isaac Newton and you also had the Bernoulli family okay one of one of the Bernoullis actually tutored Leonard Euler who solves this problem but these mathematicians and the rest of the great mathematicians of the time most likely including Newton though I'm not really sure nothing nothing ever comes up whether or not he tried to solve this but he did live during that time so he probably saw it and he didn't solve it so it was in 1735 that Euler computes this thing this infinite sum to 20 decimal places of accuracy. Okay, you can see that right here. And this is by just adding up term by term, okay, which without a calculator would take forever. So I have no idea how long this took him, but I would never want to try and do this myself. Okay, so and it was in the same year that he solves it, okay, where he essentially finds the pattern and he finds that this 1 plus 1 fourth plus 1 ninth plus 1 sixteenth plus on and on and on, the next term would be 1 25th. He found that this entire sum, when you add all of the terms up, is equal to pi squared divided by 6. Okay, pi being the circle constant. Okay, so it's a pretty interesting result, which is why we're looking at it right now. And I'd like to show you exactly how he found this. Okay, so let's go find some free space to work in. All right, so Euler starts with the sine function. Okay, sine of, we'll give it a variable, x. So he starts with the sine function, which for a while it's going to seem like this has nothing to do with the problem, but in the end it will all tie together and everything will make sense, at least somewhat. Okay, so the sine function, if you don't remember, it's just dealing with triangles. Okay, just a brief refresher. Okay, if we had a triangle with where this angle is x and we can make this angle bigger or smaller we're essentially looking at the ratio let's see this is the ratio of the opposite side of a triangle compared to its hypotenuse okay so this being the opposite right the opposite the angle and then the long side is always the hypotenuse okay so as x increases how does this ratio increase or decrease Okay, and one thing you might be able to notice is that it's always less than 1, and it's always bigger than negative 1, too, and we'll get to that. And here I have a graph of the sine function. Okay, so you can see right away that it's periodic. Okay, it goes up and down, up and down forever, essentially, and it oscillates between 1 and negative 1. Okay, so on this graph you can easily see where it has where it equals zero, okay, where the sine function equals zero. Okay, and, sorry, let me change colors. So the sine of x equals zero when 
x is 0, plus or minus pi, plus or minus 2 pi, plus or minus 3 pi, and so on. You can see these are all going to be integers, and it hits both the positive and negative values you can see here. Okay, so this function does equal 0 at an infinite amount of values, which is why it's so useful. Okay, now the next step, Euler looked at the Taylor series for the sine function, which you would learn about in calculus. So if you haven't taken that, uh, you'll just have to take my word on this, but it is very true, and if you get a chance, just look up the Taylor series videos from Khan Academy. Khan Academy, and he gives a nice intuitive explanation of why we can do this. Okay, so let's look at the sine functions Taylor series. This is x minus x cubed over 3 factorial, I'll get to that in a sec, plus x to the 5th over 5 factorial minus x to the 7th divided by 7 factorial, and I think you see the pattern plus, and it goes on and on. So the next term would be x to the 9th over 9 factorial, and then you subtract x to the 11th over 11 factorial. So what is a factorial? 5 factorial is just 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. Okay, 3 factorial is just 3 times 2 times 1. So pretty easy concept. So we can write the sine function in this way, which, if you think about it, this part right here is an infinitely long polynomial. So why is it useful that we see this as a polynomial? Okay, and to answer that, let's look at just a polynomial in general. Let's say I have a function, f of x, which is x squared plus 5x plus 6. So polynomials in general can be factored, okay? And this one in particular can be factored as x plus 2, times x plus 3. Okay, and from this form, it's much easier to see which values that it equals 0 at. Okay, namely when x is negative 2 and negative 3. Okay, but it's also possible to write this polynomial as some constant, and we'll come back to that, multiplied by 1 minus x over the root, the value at which it equals 0. Okay, in this case is negative 2. Okay, times by 1 minus x over negative 3. Okay, and we can get rid of the negatives here. Okay, so it is true that you can factor it like this, too. Okay, so we can apply this general idea to the sine function. So the sine of x is equal to some constant a times x minus the first root, which is just 0, okay, times by x minus the second root, which is pi, okay, then x minus the third root, which is negative pi, or x plus pi, okay, and we'll keep going, and times by x minus 2 pi times x minus negative 2 pi, or x plus 2 pi, Okay, and I think you see the idea. And we can kind of clean this up a little. Okay, we have the sine of x is some constant a times, well, this is just x, multiplied by, well, we can combine these, okay, because they clean up nicely when we multiply them together. So we'll use FOIL here, so x times x, so we get x squared, and then we get plus pi times x minus pi times x, so those cancel, and then we're left with minus pi times pi, which is minus pi squared. Okay, then the next term, if we multiply the two pi's together, we get x squared, the middle terms cancel out again, and we'll get minus two pi times two pi, or minus four pi squared. Okay, and the next one we do with three pi and negative three pi, which should give us 9 pi squared, okay, x squared minus 16 pi squared, okay, and you might notice that this is a 1, 4, 9, 16, these are all the squares, okay, so some familiarity so far. So here we can go one further step, and 
we know that this is some constant a times x. Now here I'll apply the general rule I was mentioning earlier, where when we have it in this factored form, we can write it in this other factored form. Okay, so it'd be 1 minus x squared over pi squared. Okay, and here we'll have 1 minus x squared over 4 pi squared times 1 minus x squared over 9 pi squared. Okay, and I think you see the idea. Okay, so Euler's next step was to divide everything by x. So then we have the sine of x divided by x is equal to, well, this whole thing without the x in it. I'll write it really fast. Okay, so we want to figure out what this constant a is. Okay, and to do that, we'll look at when x is 0. Okay, which you might think is a problem because we have a x in the denominator, but we'll come to that in a moment. But if we look at the right hand side, okay, and if we put in 0 here, 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 then all of these things right here will just be 1 times 1 times 1 times 1, okay, all the way. There are an infinity of 1s here because this is infinitely long. So, we just need to know what this left hand side is and in calculus you find that the limit as x approaches 0 of this special ratio here of sine of x over x you find that this is equal to 1. So it's it's not that hard to prove but we won't get into it right now. The important thing to note is that this does equal 1. So basically what we're left with when x is 0 is you get 1 is equal to a times by 1 times by 1 times by 1 and multiplied by an infinite amount of 1's which is still just 1 so we find that a is 1 and we can basically ignore this constant here because it's 1 okay so let's rewrite what we have so the sine of x divided by x is equal to this so we want to remember that before that the sine function was equal to this Taylor series right here okay and now we're dividing this whole thing by x so each term gets divided by x okay so here x over x this becomes a 1 this becomes an x squared this becomes an x to the fourth this becomes an x to the sixth and I'll write that down here so you can see it so this is also equal to 1 minus x squared over 3 factorial plus x to the 4th over 5 factorial minus x to the 6th over 7 factorial plus x to the 8th over 9 factorial minus and that goes on and on forever. Okay, so Euler's big step, now this is the key part of what he did is this infinite product here. Okay, so this infinitely long thing here. He's gonna multiply all of it together. Okay, and it might sound crazy because in a lot of ways it is very complicated, but if you do it step by step, it's not that bad. Okay, so first, we're gonna multiply all the one terms together. Okay, so there'd be one here and it just keeps going. Okay, so we'll multiply all of those together and we get 1, okay? Now our next step is to multiply all the 1's together except for one term, okay? So, for instance, multiply these 1's and so on, but we're also going to multiply it into this term, okay? So our last term we're going to multiply by the minus x squared over pi squared, okay? So that's what we get, minus x squared over pi squared. Okay, and we're going to do the same thing with this x squared over 4 pi squared. So we'll multiply this 1 by this term, multiplied by the 1's from the rest of the terms. Okay, so we get a minus x squared over 4 pi squared. And then we'll do it again for this term. So we got 1 times 1 times minus x squared over 9 pi squared, times 1 times 1 times 1, and just keep going. So you get a minus x squared over 9 pi squared and you can imagine doing this for all the terms where 
everything is multiplied by one except for one term at a time, okay? Whether it be this one or this one or x squared over 16 pi squared, which is the next one. So minus x squared over 16 pi squared. The next one would be minus x squared over 25 pi squared, and it keeps going. Okay, so dot, 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 and then, so that's all if we multiply just one term. So the next step would be to multiply one times by this one and by this one, and then the rest are all just ones. Okay, so now we're combining two terms at a time, which you get an x to the fourth power term. Okay, but we're not actually going to worry about that right now. Okay, that'll just make it way more complicated than what we're doing. So if I clean this up, I have this is equal to 1 minus, and notice all these have x squared, so I'll factor that out. 1 minus x squared. So here we have 1 over pi squared plus 1 over 4 pi squared plus 1 over 9 pi squared plus 1 over 16 pi squared. Okay, and those go on forever. And then we would have plus an x to the fourth power term, okay, and that would be pretty messy. It's essentially all the combinations of two of these, okay. That would be one combination, this would be one combination, this would be another combination, okay. So the fourth power is all combinations of two of these terms, okay, if you get that idea. Okay, and it'll keep going. There will be a minus x to the 6 multiplied, and these are all combinations of, of three of these things at once. Okay, and the rest of the terms are all multiplied by 1. Okay, so we don't really need to concern ourselves with any of these higher power terms. Okay, they're, for our purposes, we don't even really need to pay attention to them. We're really just focused on this x squared part. Okay? And it's because, remember I wrote up here, that this sine x over x is also equal to this, this Taylor series of the sine function divided by x. Okay, so this right here is equal to this right here. Okay, so if these are equal, then notice here we have an x squared and here we have an x squared, okay? So if these are truly equal, then the coefficients on these x squared terms must also be equal, okay? So this coefficient is minus 1 over 3 factorial. So let me write that. So minus 1 over, let me change colors. So minus 1 over 3 factorial, which we can rewrite as minus 1 over 1 times 2 times 3 is 6. Okay, and we know this is equal to this coefficient on x squared. This entire series right here is the coefficient on x squared, so it's equal to this whole thing, okay, which is 1 over pi squared plus 1 over 4 pi squared plus 1 over 9 pi squared plus 1 over 16 pi squared, and so on. Oh, I'm sorry, and there's also a negative in front of this, so this is all negative. Okay, so right away you can see that both sides are negative, so those cancel, become positive. And the next step is all of these denominators have a pi squared in them, so we can factor that out. So we have 1 sixth is equal to 1 over pi squared. Okay, and what I'm left with is 1 plus 1 fourth plus 1 ninth plus 1 sixteenth and so on, which is the Basel problem. Okay, and if I just multiply each side by pi squared, I get that pi squared over 6 is this Basel problem. Okay, and that is how Euler solved it. And the truth is that the techniques he used were not completely rigorous by our standards, but they did get the right answer. And at the time, that's what was important. Okay, in later years, he did come up with much more rigorous proofs of this.